welcome you to the second IHACA lecture of the 2021 season. Tonight, it also gives me great pleasure to welcome Professor Rima Vaithyanathan as our guest speaker. Rima is Professor of Health Economics at Auckland University of Technology. So that's that bit here. Where she also directs the Center for Social Data Analytics, which is that bit there. <laughs> as well, she's attached to the University of Queensland <laughs> as a professor of social data analytics. Uh, after working in the public sector in New Zealand for some 10 years around the 90s, um, Rima obtained her PhD from the University of Auckland, this uh, institution, in 2000. Afterwards, shuttling between Australian universe, National University, Harvard Medical School, and the University of Auckland, she finally joined AUT, where she has been full professor since 2013. Her uh, peripatetic academic lifestyle has not abated, however, and she leads work in the US, Singapore, and Australia, as well as New Zealand. Over the years, her health economics interests uh, have grown to include data science, <clears throat> in particular predictive analytics and machine learning, and especially their application towards social good. Tonight, amongst uh, other experiences, she will draw on her experience implementing and scaling up the Allegheny Family Screening Tool to tell us about emerging rules of engagement for the use of data analytics towards social good. Rima's depth of knowledge, engagement, compassion, and vibrancy have made her a favorite of the media and the lecture circuit. I look very much forward to tonight's lecture and ask you to warmly welcome Rima with me. Thank you, everyone. I was just uh, reflecting on this um, title of my talk, which was actually written in pre-COVID times. Paul, I think I was supposed to present maybe in 2019, probably 2020. It's been a long time. And of course, it was the lockdown. And then we delayed it. And funnily enough, the day I was supposed to present, we also had another mini lockdown. So this, um, this kind of grand title of a case study in human-centered AI was written in those optimistic pre-COVID days. Now it's probably going to be a tour into sort of a case study in self-centered AI, in self-reflective AI, in AI where I'm going to tell you possibly all the things I did wrong more than the things I did right. So um, today I'm going to sort of start with why I think there are challenges in the public sector to applying machine learning and data, advanced data analytics by starting to talk about the private sector. Because, you know, oftentimes when you go and meet ministers and government officials, so everyone's thinking, gosh, we have such huge intractable problems in the public sector. How to keep children safe, how to stop and prevent interpartment violence, you know, how to stop, stop a pandemic, how to get healthcare out to rural and regional parts of the country. These are huge intractable problems. And then we see these rise of technology behemoths like Facebook and Google and Uber. And we think, wow, these guys really know how to launch rockets. Surely the private sector must be able to help us solve these huge and intractable problems. And data must be one of the pieces, digital technology, AI, must be all the pieces we need to bring into the public sector and help us solve these huge problems. And in fact, if you go through, and if you're a minister, this is what you see, right? You see. Back in 1998, um, Amazon had already started its item-based collaborative filtering, which basically allowed Amazon to trawl through millions of similar uh, books that you had purchased to other consumers had purchased and give you recommendations. So this is more than 20 years ago. In 2000, Google launched its AdWord campaign uh, platform where you could basically auction, they were auctioning off search words so that if people search for certain things, a vendor or a marketer or an advertiser can purchase that word for that next hour 
and advertise in response to that word search. Um, you know, and it wasn't just digital platforms that were using data. Walmart is famous for, you know, in 2004, they were using advanced um, data analytics to make sure that they were stocking just in time in their thousands of retail outlets across the country. And, you know, if you look at our own Warehouse New Zealand 20 years later, that's in fact what they're planning to do. So, you know, these were huge uh, advances of the time, and the private sector was really quite gung-ho about using data and gaining huge comparative advantage. And we know what happened. I mean, Walmart's profits rose uh, hugely. Uh, you know, everyone knows how valuable uh, Facebook and Google and those IPOs were. They were just <laughs> shocking in how large and valuable the market thought this endeavor was. And why was the private sector so successful? Well, I've got a theory. You, you know, you probably all have theories, but I, I kind of boil it down to sort of four things that the private sector did really well. First of all, they realized that customers were willing to give their data away for not much, for free airport Wi-Fi or, you know, a Zoom app that will make you look like a cat. A customer was willing to give away all their personal data. So that was kind of quite an amazing discovery uh, that the private sector made, that people really were just willing to give troves of data away for some very minor customer value. The second thing I guess that they uh, realized is that the data that they were sitting on was a huge strategic asset. Previously, they were just records of purchasing and sales and, you know, they weren't really seen as an asset. But now they realized that this end-to-end -end data that they were capturing and growing exponentially could really be used and not just used by them, but unsold to other businesses. So they realized that this data trove is really something quite amazing that they were able to sell on. And so then we got the end-to-end -end data business. Uber is a perfect example, right? Uber probably knows more about commuting patterns in Auckland City than the Auckland Council does, right? But is Uber giving Auckland Council that data? No, sooner or later they're going to come to Auckland Council and give them an offer they can't refuse because suddenly Auckland Council will realize that almost all the commuting is being done by Uber and there's hardly any information that Auckland Council has about its own traffic flows. It really all belongs to Uber. So we have the situation where these troves of data are required for the business of this profit-making company, but it's now valuable for other people, and damn it all, they're going to sell it and make money out of it. And the third, fourth thing that I think was really quite remarkable, for example, in Amazon and YouTube, is that a lot of these algorithms were really seamless. When you were on their platforms, you didn't know if these things were customized to you or were just generally seen by everyone. If you were going onto a generic platform where everything was what everyone saw and suddenly you had a clunky movement to your customized platform, it becomes a bit creepy, doesn't it? But here I am, you know, using Facebook and thinking, oh, everyone is being advertised dog training devices. I've got a COVID puppy, so I'm constantly looking to see how to train this damn puppy. So that's probably, Everyone is being see, uh, showed uh, puppy training uh, leads. So there's nothing clunky, there's nothing creepy about it. No one's saying, Rima, I noticed you've been searching for dog training hints. Here's some leads that might help you. So that was quite a valuable uh, innovation, that kind of seamlessness where people are moving from highly customized to uncustomized without noticing it and feeling creeped out. And so the best example of this is 2018, 2020. So excited by this idea that economists did it twice. 
They call data the new oil, basically. Unfortunately, like all oil companies, you can have major disasters and oil slicks. So then what happened is that you have our public sector looking with envy over there because let's look at what happened in the public sector. And here is my kind of potted summary of some uh, international examples of the public sector trying to be me too, trying to go, hey, minister, we, you know, we can uh, have sort of smart young techies, we can have segways, you know, we can build out campuses with um, bean bags, we can do what they're doing in Silicon Valley. Probably the earliest example I know about is the Compass tool, which was a tool used uh, in the US to help identify people at risk of recidiv recidivism. So people who left prison would they, on parole, would they break parole or not? Uh, another example from 2005 is the UK NHS PAR2, which was a tool designed to predict readmissions to hospital. In 2012, New Zealand brought in the NEAT prediction tool, and I'm glad to see there are students in the back there because this is a tool that is, was applied to students, and I'm sure many of you didn't realize that there was a tool being applied to test whether students are likely to leave school and not be in employment, education, or training. So that's, yeah. Just one point, what does NWT mean? NEAT, not in employment, education, or training. Thank you. Sure. Um, uh, Center uh, Link RoboDebt was another example where the uh, Center Link in Australia started generating debt letters without any human interaction, just automated debt predictions. And of course, the IBM Watson was a wonderful example of this. You know, I, if you talk to, and I remember talking to IBM Watson representatives, you know, five, five years ago, they honestly, honestly thought Watson was going to answer all our questions. It was going to be an answering machine. And what happened? Well, they was, <clears throat> Compass was controversial. It's, uh, led to a huge uh, expose. This is a seminal piece of work in data bias and algorithms, which was published by ProPublica, uh, showing that the Compass tool was uh, so-called biased, it's a loaded word, but biased uh, in some technical way uh, against uh, black people when it was applied. The NHS admission tool was canceled. I think the NEAT prediction tool is being rebuilt right now. The robo-debt was hugely controversial and it was litigated and the IBM Watson, if everyone wants anyone, a wonderful case study in the failure of this type of technology is Watson. Uh, does everyone know what Watson is? IBM spent huge amounts of money developing uh, uh, AI technology that was uh, designed to uh, kind of catapult IBM into kind of uh, advanced lead in the AI space. It was an absolute disaster. They, some of the early experiments they did with German hospitals is really worth reading about because what, the, what that German experiment showed is that people don't like it when AI is wrong in ridiculous ways. So what happened in that German experiment is IBM Watson was actually pretty good at helping doctors diagnose diseases. But when they were wrong, they were sometimes, the AI was sometimes spectacularly wrong. So wrong that the clinician is going, even my resident doctor would know not that this was not the disease. And that completely undermined the faith of the clinician in this technology. So that's a really interesting, you know, they were right more than the clinician, but the clinician hated it when they were wrong and they actually uh, gave, gave up on that technology. So we have public sector envy, and I just pulled this off our current digital minister, who is Chris Farfoy, saying the strategy for digital public service 
offers an opportunity for our public service to move into the future, giving people the same speed, quality, experience with government agents that they have with the private sector organization. So we have private sector envy. But as I said, be careful what you wish for, because when you treat data like oil, you can have oil slips. And this is Facebook share price the day The Guardian published on the Cambridge Analytica scandal. So uh, it, this Cambridge uh, Analytica scandal was a super good example of what happens when you treat people's data like oil. What the Cambridge Analytica scandal was about is that Facebook had allowed a third party uh, to um, a water profiling company basically called Cambridge Analytica to extract data from around 50 million users. The genius of this uh, Cambridge Analytica data extraction is that a user might agree to have their data extracted. Through, for, for, in exchange for answering a personality quiz, I think it was. Anyway, so you say, yes, I want to all answer that personality quiz I'm offered on Facebook. Yes, you can have my data. The genius of Cambridge Analytica was that when the user consented to their data being extracted, it extracted the whole network of users' uh, uh, users' friends. So it was able through one or two, you know, a few people consenting to extract millions. And um, it was quite uh, allowed the company to actually help President Trump's campaign, um, allowed them to do super targeted voter profiling, um, and Facebook, as the scandal broke, lost 24 billion, 24 billion US dollars as a result of that scandal. That is what treating your data like oil and not realizing that it's about people costs you. So when the minister looks over to the private sector and thinks, why can't we be more like the private sector? The challenge is what is it going to mean if we start using data like the private sector? And I think a really good example, a really insightful comment comes from Alexandra Kogan, who, uh, who was uh, part of Cambridge Analytica. He said, honestly, we thought we were acting perfectly appropriately. We thought we were doing something that was really normal. So that's a kind of telling quote that even within the halls of Cambridge, of Facebook and Cambridge, they really thought this is our data. People have consented to give us our data. Why should we, um, why should we uh, have a problem? They've consented. And consent is everything. We legally own their data. And of course, we know that Cambridge Analytica is not alone in this. Google has had the most torrid time trying to build an ethics group. If you follow Google, every day it's a new scandal. So they started off by thinking, you know, we, are the, we have the super smartest people in the world sitting here. So what we're going to do is appoint a Google ethics committee. Well, they did. And that committee walked out en masse saying that they weren't being allowed to see enough into the business of Google. So they thought, no, what we'll do is we'll start recruiting people in to run our ethics, data ethics line. And Timit Gebru, does anyone, has anyone? Anyway, there's a fantastic piece in The Wired from a couple of weeks ago on Timit Gebru, Google her. She was um, a black woman employed by, face, uh, by Google to address these issues. Subsequently, she was sacked in a very high profile sacking because she wanted to publicly present at a conference on some of the issues of concern about some of the work they were doing about uh, language mining, I think. So, you know, every time they try to do something, it's another face plant. So what is the problem? Why can't these people get to do the stuff without losing $25 billion in value. 
I think the problem is that because they rely on consent, they don't think about what we now call social license. Users will consent for their data to be given at an airport. But God, if you use the data in a way that they're unhappy with or they didn't expect, they will rescind that social license. So when I see the way that these companies were using the data, I see that they were really relying and over-relying on consent. They were seeing data as oil. Facebook data at the end of the day is people's hopes and dreams, their stories about their trauma, stories about their celebrations, it's about their lives. No one thinks they're giving those stories away. And I actually have visited some of these because one of the things these companies always do is try to get people like me to come along and work with their data for social good. And I have been and listened to how they pitch their data. And I was very uncomfortable with how they pitch their data because they call it their data. And it's their custodians of people's data. They are never owners of the data. So I really feel there's a huge challenge there in those companies to understand that. What I said was a strategic advantage, which is this wonderfully seamless AI to, uh, you know, general to, uh, you don't know if you're being custom, custom, trans, uh, you know, custom, my, you don't know if that recommendation is for you. That seemed like a comparative advantage, but actually it's becoming what's called, uh, called non-transparent or opaque. The reason people are upset about YouTube now is that we don't know to what extent YouTube algorithms pulls us into the dark kind of ex uh, extending uh, people's uh, exposure to more and more challenging or more and more um, uh, demanding sort of uh, 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 content. So we don't know if YouTube algorithms are pulling people in, and that's one of the challenges we have. All right, so, so I kind of think of this as ex Explicitly having a data science conundrum that I think all of us now face. It's no longer enough to say we can do amazing things with data because we can do amazing things with data. Every day we'll be able to do more and more amazing things with data. So the true research question for all of us is not what we can do with data, but how to decide what we should do with data. Should we do what we can do? And I'm gonna talk about a very controversial thing that I've been doing with data, which is trying to help support child abuse, uh, uh, child protection. Um, so this is, uh, um, the Center for Social Data Analytics does a lot of uh, data science projects and social goods. We, we implement um, machine learning tools in child protection in homelessness, in elder abuse, so we have a lot of projects. But I'm going to talk about the project that probably, you know, is the one that we're probably best known for, um, which is the Allegheny Family Screening Tool. So what's the problem? The problem is not very different in New Zealand, to be honest. We have millions of people calling in across the country saying that uh, a child, they think a child is being abused or victimized. So these are sometimes called referrals or hotline calls. It's just calls that come in from teachers, from community members, from family members, saying that they think a child is being abused. What's the problem? The problem is every time there's a death in the community, there's a front page of maltreatment, more people call more children in. So much so that one in three American children get a referral and an investigation by the time they're 18. Mm -hmm. Now, in case you think that seems crazy high, one, 40% of Maori children are reported to Oranga Tamariki by the age they're 18. 10% of Maori children are removed at least once from home 
by the age of 18. We have a child protection system that is bigger than we ever thought it was going to be. It's huge. It trawls through our communities, especially our communities of color and our poor communities, and it reports them, it investigates them, it finds on them, and sometimes it removes them. The problem is whether it's doing a good job um, because when you look at the other end, half of all children, and this could be because the system is protective, but half of children in the Allegheny context, I don't know this for national studies, half of children who end up with a critical or fatal abuse were never investigated. So we're doing something wrong when we go around and investigate such a huge number of children, and yet we are not precise enough to investigate the ones we need to. So the question that we had in Allegheny Family Screening Tool is how can we safely reduce our investigation rates, or how can we be more precise in who we investigate? So Allegheny is, uh, is in the city of Pittsburgh, really, so this is a project in Pittsburgh. And what we did is we built a simple lasso machine learning tool which relies on, I can't remember, maybe 150 features uh, taken from an integrated data warehouse. So the way the tool works is when the call comes in, the, um, the algorithm harvests data from the data warehouse pulls in lots of different features from lots of different systems about the child, the parents, and a history in the system, and produces a score for each child named on the call. The score is sort of 1 to 20, where each score is designed that 5% of referrals on average will come into that category. How well did it predict? Well, it predicted in the first instance removal of the child in two years. So I always, when I do training on these tools, I always say to people, it's not perfect because a child who scores 20, almost half of them are not going to be removed. A child who scores one, around 2% of them are going to be removed. So we never use this tool without it supporting human decisions. So this call screener was, was using this tool to help them make decisions. Prior to this, the decision was simply, um, sorry, uh, so the other thing we always do in our, or try to do in our work is these are what's sometimes called proxy training outcomes. So when we build a machine learning tool, you use something that you collect with sufficient prevalence and in the data system to be able to predict that thing. We predict removals because those are kind of the best long-term outcome that is adverse, suggests true need for protection and some real evidence that there is uh, abuse or neglect that's happening to the child. However, it is not truly abuse or neglect. So what we have to do is to correlate the score to ground truth measures of abuse and neglect. And so in Allegheny, we took this data set and over one and a half years of ethics application and lots and lots of work, we crosswalked that data with all the hospital records in the local children's hospital, which gives us a universal hospitalization record. And we asked ourselves, take a child who scores a one, take a child who scores a 20, track them into the hospital data set, and this is, by the way, all done in, on anonymous data, so we don't know who they are. It was done under HIPAA regulations. It was matched by a third party, so we don't get to see names, first names, last name, nothing like that. So this is done under highly confidential conditions. And what we, forget about the random and max, this is from a paper we published last year, but 
What we did is we looked at any injury hospitalization, maltreatment hospitalization, and suicide hospitalization in older children. Those three things are known to be kind of ground truth measures of trauma. And what you can see is it's, again, it's not perfect, but it has a, a, a quite a strong correlation between the scores and, is, and hospitalization, especially for maltreatment. Now, what we did also did is did cancer, because cancer shouldn't be correlated to the scores. It's slightly correlated because possibly there is a poverty overlay in both maltreatment and cancer, but it's not highly correlated. So then we went back and looked at how humans were making decisions before the tool. And we went back and we scored those kids. And did you know that for the highest risk cases, one in three um, one third of those highest risk cases were being screened out. The humans were saying there's nothing to see here, there's not, nothing to do. And yet the algorithm said they were high risk and if, if we followed the children in the data, they got re-referred and removed at very high rates. On the other hand, half of all low risk cases were being screened in, half. Half of all low, half the children who came in where the algorithm said they were low risk, didn't need anything, half of them were being screened in by human. Now think of the trauma. Being screened in, in this case, is being investigated. A mother is, has a child at home, possibly under stress, because these are not... Uh, middle-class parents that these families are going to. Mother is at home, child is under stress, someone called mom in saying child was running around without shoes. Investigator knocks on that mom's door, an investigator who has the power to remove the child in under emergency orders. That is what an investigation entails. Half of the children who scored a low risk were having that investigation done to them. So we can't, you know, this is not okay, right? So, so then the question that we have to ask ourselves is we did this, what is the guidelines that we use? So at our center, we kind of have quite a long and lengthy process around these our projects. And we have six guidelines. The first is that we'll always have agency leadership. These are the people who are elected by the county, by the country, to lead and do the work. The problem with machine learning and AI tools is they're incredibly opaque. Very difficult for our ministers, for our government, for our representatives to know what's happening under the hood. And I always say to regulators, Give me 10 different things I have to meet. I will meet each of those 10 things with the most biased, most egregious algorithm you can want. I have too many degrees of freedom when I build an algorithm to be able to be regulated in this kind of uh, tick box way. You peep, there is just too much opacity in how you engineer your data, in how you design your ML tool, in how, what outcomes you choose. There's just not... When the decisions we make as data scientists are so complicated that no one can understand what we're doing, let alone the agencies. So when you do a data science project of this complexity, the agency needs to understand what you're doing and you, they have to know you, they share your values and you share their values. And that's what all our partners say is what we know is you guys share our values, then everything else is okay. So the other thing we always do when we build these tools is we really concentrate on having a multidisciplinary team. So the team that built this included the leadership, people who specialized in business process. We had someone from University of Auckland, Tim Dare and Eileen Gamera from Berkeley do an independent ethics review that was went to, um, went to the county. We did technical fairness, disparities analysis, evaluation. Um, so it takes a 
it takes a village to, to develop and deploy an algorithm that is so complicated and so, you know, controversial. We were committed to transparency and fairness, so we always publish technical reports, and we also publish uh, the technical fairness aspects of our work. Uh, there was an independent evaluation done uh, by uh, Stanford on the impact of the tool on decision making, and they found uh, some improvement in the quality of decision making and some reduction in racial disparities. We're very committed to community voice, so I have presented to communities all over Pittsburgh, communities of color, families who've had children removed. Because one of the things we are committed to is when we do these projects in partnerships with agencies, the people who are go, whose lives are going to be most affected by these tools, there is the voice that we need to hear the earliest. Understand their concerns and then think about how we can build machine learning tools that respond to their concerns. So we're very committed to that. And, oops. and so as a result, um, so Allegheny Family Stream Tool has by and large got positive reviews. So it was, uh, you know, review like a, a bit, there was a very in-depth piece in the New York Times, which was by and far large positive. It's been cited um, in various places as the closest to an open source use of this technology or sort of ethical use of this technology. Um, Virginia Eubanks devoted a chapter of her book, Automated Inequality, on that topic and was not as complimentary about it, but on by and large, I think because of the care that we took with this work, it has really, I think, helped people feel trust uh, tr trusted. And you know, that includes me sitting in rooms with ACLU, uh, people in uh, you know, sort of draft church halls, sitting down and having dinner with you know, families to understand and understand their concerns, to share what we're doing. So there's a lot of shoe leather commitment that it takes to do this sort of work in a way that respects the people who are behind the data. It is the opposite of treating data like oil. Um, so the elephant in the room with this sort of work is obviously the question of bias. That's the thing that everyone is most concerned about whenever we talk about the use of ML in these kinds of high stakes decision environments. By bias, obviously, we mean you know, prejudice or favoritism that might work for or against the tool, uh, a group of people. So I think in our center, the position we come from is data is biased, humans are biased. How do we use data tools to help redress the bias of humans. That's basically the question we're trying to ask. And um, I'm sort of, you know, every year, anyone who follows the fat ML literature here, anyone's doing their work on fairness and transparency in machine learning, I mean, every year there's another 20 definitions of fairness, I've stopped counting. But the whole community on fairness and transparency machine learning is constantly publishing stuff on fairness and transparency. And I suppose I always say, it's not a technical problem and it doesn't need a technical solution. So there are three aspects that I think of when I think of addressing bias in these things. Number one is understanding what families of color, black, African-American, Maori, Pacifica, families in those uh, communities want to see change in this system. And the thing that I have noticed is that if, and, and this is as a woman of color living in New Zealand, is, uh, we, you know, when you are subject uh, to uh, racism, it really affects your trust in the system. It changes your behavior. And so when you talk to people of color, you realize that they are coming at it from a very 
un untrusting place and where they have changed their behavior in order to accommodate or respond to what they see as racism around them. And just a personal example, I was reflecting, can I give you an example of what, what this looks like? Well, I was going for a run, and this is a couple of months ago, trying to keep up my lockdown fitness. <laughs> you know, we all got fit over lockdown, and I was trying, I fa it's faded now, but a couple of months ago, I was dry, running around Sl Sandringham Road, teenage guy, Saturday afternoon, Sandringham Road, teenage boy sitting on a on a bus stop, two, three mates or something, running past, and the yellow racial slur at me. I mean, you know, this is not, this is unusual, but happens. So I keep running, then I come back and I say to my husband, you know what, I think I shouldn't run on Sandringham Road, and I shouldn't run on a Saturday afternoon where all the young men are up, out and about. And I'm serious, I thought that to myself. I thought those are the two things I'm gonna stop doing. So you can see how when, I, when people who are subject to that over their lives come to a meeting about data science tool, what they are reflecting is a whole history of having changed what they do and having not trusted things because things didn't work out. So if I can do that, you can, I mean, that's irrational, right? It wasn't about running on Sandringham Road on a Saturday afternoon, but I swear since then I have not done that. So you see how powerful this is. And so to understand that from that community's point of view, before you even start asking technical questions about your data science too, is so important. And the other question we ask, of course we ask is a tool unbiased, we do the standard equity analysis, you know, comparing TPRs, PPVs, and so on. This, the second question, the third question I think people don't ask enough is does it actually reduce racial disparities by the humans who are using the tools? So here's an example of me. Uh, we're doing a whole research project on this with some PhD students, but here's a little taste test of what that, uh, of what um, Catherine is, 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 going, is going, discovering. So on the left-hand side, you see in blue the screening um, in rate of uh, white children, and in red, the screening in rate of black children. On the horizontal axis, you see the score, and I've grouped them into two, so it's one to 10 rather than one to 20. And I've given you standard error, 95% confidence intervals. And so what do you see there? You see that when a black child came in, that's the red line, and got a high score. This is before they saw the score, please. So this is humans making the decision. I've gone back and scored it. On average, black children who score high have a higher screening in rate than white children who have exactly the same history. Exactly the same history. Black children who score low, who basically have no history, have a higher screening in rate than white children who score low. What happened after the two came in? You can see that at least at the top end, that disparity has fallen. Because now, what is a call screener seeing? The human is seeing black, but they're also seeing low risk sometimes. Or they're seeing white, and now they're seeing high risk. Before, when they saw white, they possibly didn't see risk. And one of the things that when I talk to communities of color, they tell me is there are lots of white children out there and white families out there at risk, and you guys just don't go see them. There are lots of black families who are perfectly capable of keeping their children safe and having a thriving family, but you guys go knock on their door. So that's the story that is, you know, which resonates in our head when we do this work. So I think, you know, it's, a, it's as a result of this work. So there's a really, 
well, I, I would say interesting, there's a collector's edition of Scientific American that just came out, which is all the strategies for overcoming racism. It's kind of the zeitgeist of the science of overcoming racism. And our work is in there because of the ability of these sorts of algorithms to try to reverse the human bias that is naturally, we're all privy to. It is natural, it is almost universal. So I guess the data science um, conundrum that our center has tried to answer is we can do amazing things with data, when and how should we do it? And I think those six sort of elements and a good start is not to treat your data like oil. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Hi. I uh, just have a question from very early on in the in the talk, like about people giving consent for comms user data. It turns out, like, it seems that people might be more willing to give consent to the companies rather than government. Say Google wants to get your location, that people saying, "Fine, we don't care to have it." And then when the government wants it, wanting like, "Why do you want to have the data?" For example, last year when COVID-19 hit, they were trying to have the Tracer app. And I think remember people having this kind of conversations. So it's wondering if you know why this is the case and what pe people or government or companies can do to make it a bit different. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of, yeah, that's a very good question. So the question is, why are people so willing to give consent to private sector when they're not willing to give consent to government? Well, I think, I mean, obviously, because government has regulatory power and a lot of what they can do is unconsented, right? Being a citizen is all the consent they need in order to do certain things. So the demarcation between when government asks your consent and where it doesn't ask your consent is always woolly with government. That's why governments need social license, because the consent process is not as a clear cut for them, you know, because they can imprison you. Google can't imprison you. It's, you know, that, that is basically, you know, if you look at a kind of, take a sort of a Nozickian view, that's the bottom line. They can enslave you if they're government. They can't if you're Google. So that kind of basic dichotomy leads to that whole relationship with government. The second one is go democratic governments always have this the yin and the yang of uh, government and an opposition. So an opposition is always trying to attack a government. So whenever private sector companies say how easy, you know, how well they do, I say try running your business when someone's job is to pull your business down. Like try running your business then. So the problem with government is that they run government while someone else's job, paid day job, is to destroy everything you do. Now Tesla is almost like that. I don't know if you've read like Elon Musk because there's lots of people shorting on Tesla shares. And so Elon Musk has been really complaining because people are shorting on Tesla shares and trying to push Tesla down. And I thought to myself, Elon, welcome to the government because that's exactly what people are doing. They're shorted on you and they're trying to pull you down. So those are, I think, the two real big challenges that you have between the private and public sector. You've got AI technology used, and you mentioned the black population. Okay, I'm sorry, can you wait until you get the mic because we're getting... I don't need it, I've got a loud enough voice. No, it's because we're recorded. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> You've got AI technology used primarily in reference to facial recognition and the algorithm negativity that comes about um, through historic references that it doesn't tend to recognise the non-white populations. And New Zealand's had its experiences with the Pacifica and Maori communities, and in America it's the Afro-American, and they highlighted the Hispanic communities specifically during the COVID periods. How is that brought about? Oh, how was that actually recognised when you're referring to technical references in big industry or most IT companies as data warehousing and data mining? 
um, so and information I, silos to I do agree. basically to extract the data that is part of um, various gathering forces from mm -hmm. most common one is driver's licenses in the US and driver's licenses here and yet we've also got a population that don't even have physical IDs which is a barrier to them getting um, community support in initiative um, financial support yeah, those are very good question, points. Yeah, I think we have a different kind of system for different sort of MoMA communities of color, but that's, that's a challenge for the private sector. Well, we've got recognition very much in the public sector as well. Mm. Thanks for the presentation, Doc. Going back to where you were talking about children at risk, and especially when they're of color, um, from experience being West Indian, um, most of the people in the system have a bias because they're not of color, they're melanin challenged. So the, they do not understand what a lot of people of color go through. So what's not happening and what's not reflected in the data is who's asking the question and are they culturally sensitive? For example, when you said, well, child's running around without shoes, well, you know, in West Indian culture and a lot of island cultures, they run around without shoes. That does not mean the child is unsafe, but to yeah, sorry, that European, was the point I was trying to make, actually. Right, I was trying but to, to a make European, that point. they're going to feel unsafe. So they're going to yank that child out of the system, thinking they're well intentioned. And then what's also not told um, to the children, you should tell them that, you know what, if you go into foster care, there's like a 20, 25% chance that you're going to be abused. Be careful of your choice. Uh, that's the other part of the equation that's missing. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Um, mine is like a physical question, drawing from your conclusion that we shouldn't treat data like oil. So for the private uh, sector, whose main objective is to uh, make profit and maximize profit, so if they don't treat data as oil, what commodity will you recommend they treat data as? Well, I think, you know, I, when, we, when um, I look at ethics of the data science team that I lead, I do a, a lecture for them saying, for you, it looks like data of ones and zeros, but they are the lives of people there behind that data. And you have to respect them as if, you know, exactly like the people's lives that you see laid out in front of them. Now, in the private sector, you know, they will do that training for customers, right? They'll say, when someone comes in your shop, respect them, make them feel good, you know, treat them well. When they see data, I think it's, it's kind of, when people see data, they just see zeros and ones, and I think we have to change the way we train data scientists and think about data, that these are the lives of people. Now, of course, you know, if Facebook look back, I think they would say that, you know, as you know, Biden has recently announced a hugely aggressive re, um, kind of uh, re-regulation of some of these platforms. Now, what gave him the political mandate to do that, I think partly stems from these sorts of Cambridge Analytica scandal that slowly over time de de uh, uh, stabilized the popular consensus about these digital platforms. So I think the, the, the kind of the mechanism I see is that the lasting reputation of these companies who continue to treat data like oil 
emboldens the democratic system and the governments to start regulating them more, and together that will drive a little bit more change in behavior. That's my feeling, but I don't know. I could be mistaken in being optimistic, but I know this theme is the bright side, so my bright side view is that as these companies keep treating people like oil, people will start wanting more regulation. They will give their ministers and governments authority to regulate. As they regulate, and particularly on the tax front, this will make the companies realize that those, that kind of attitudes that they've been demonstrating have got to change. Hi, sorry, just um, building on some of the discussions so far. So, so, you, so you mentioned a whole st lot of stuff about um, the importance of social license or public license, both for private sector, also the public sector. But, what a, but that's probably more like a situation in um, like Western or, or countries that have more of an individualist sort of outlook. What about countries where the governments are a bit more authoritarian and they might not be, be too worried about um, having, having consent or social license from the communities. That is, yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, international human rights organizations will have to have a stream of work around data and, you know, some of the things uh, happening, at least reported to happen in China with the Uyghur community is an example of where perhaps uh, data privacy and data rights have to also be part of kind of international human rights movements. I can't really think about what else you can do except bring to bear the human rights um, uh, sort of uh, not-for-profit and um, sort of the civil sector, the international uh, civil sector to try to do something about it, unless you have a suggestion. This is kind of a hypothetical question because you, I don't think you could possibly get the sort of data that I'm envisaging, but suppose you had uh, a, a, a real live definite response, very, a binary response, so, you know, the, the kid is, gets abused or doesn't. You have a bunch of predictors for that that you put into your machine learning algorithm to uh, try and predict whether or not the child gets abused and you have a bunch of data in which you've got all those predictors and you have a binary response, child has been abused or hasn't. And all, all of those predictors are, that you use are nice and unbiased, they, they don't involve the ethnic group that the kid is in. Now suppose you add the ethnicity of the kid to that predictors, to those predictors and look at the uh, the, the significance of that. Is it not quite plausible that that uh, ethnic group will have predictive power over and above the other predictors that you have put into the system? Um, you know, obviously it depends on what else you've put in. We know that, for example, <laughs> poverty has a causal effect through stress on trauma for families. We also know that poverty is unevenly distributed because of history of segregation or, or colonization is unevenly distributed. So now if, I, if poverty is one of my predictors, <laughs> then race won't matter. If poverty isn't one of my predictors, now race is a proxy po poverty and it will matter. So the hypothesis of whether race will matter or not is really a question of where the, the other things you put into your model and more importantly at an institutional level, what the institutional systems are to drive that difference. So, it, so to me, Yes, so that's the answer. Like whether it matters or not depends on what else you added. <laughs> Simple. So essentially, you're saying that, that if you have poverty in your collection of predictors, then ethnicity probably won't show up as being as adding predictive power. Well, I mean, it's you know we it's a very flexible functional form. You've got crim, criminal history. You've got you know I could predict race with my features. 
You know what I'm saying? Like, my features are summary statistics of race. So given my predictors, I can predict race. What's the point of adding race in? You know, because there's so much uh, disparity in, in the data. So it's, you know, it's a moot question whether adding race or not makes your tool less or more biased because you've just got so much disparity. And it's true in New Zealand. Any data set, you've got huge disparities. So, you know, whether you add it or not. This will be the last question. Okay. Um, you had mentioned that um, many of these companies, such as Google, Zuckerberg and Company, treat data like oil. The problem that happens if, if you were to take a survey of this room right now, I could almost guarantee that 75% plus would have just clicked through, not have read the agreement, and know what they're agreeing to. And yet, if you don't agree, you don't get to use a service. Would it help if somehow through whatever regulation or hoops you got to go through that um, in non-legalese speak, because most people don't, most of us here don't understand legalese, which is what this stuff is written in, and just say, if you just agree to this, some crap will happen that you don't expect or may not like. You may want to read this. <laughs> Would something like that help? Uh, or even then get them to break certain things down that regular humans can understand it? Because I'm a technologist, and I don't understand legalese. Yes, yeah, so I mean, uh, that's another presentation. I was on a national committee called the Data Futures Working Group. And um, the piece of work I led was called uh, Developing Guidelines for Trusted Data Use. And for that work, we worked, uh, Massey University uh, did uh, 46 workshops across the country asking people what questions do they want answered. And we came up with seven questions that they want answered and a data dial that basically did that, said here are the seven questions people want answered about what you're going to do with their data. Answer those questions, put them on a data dial. Now, that didn't, that was under a previous government. Governments change, things move on, I guess. I don't know what happens. Things get into a black hole. <laughs> this uh, concludes the second lecture of the uh, eHacker series of lectures for this season. Thank you very much. We have a little token of appreciation. It's very rare. <laughs> And I would like to thank you again for a very thought-provoking presentation. Thanks. Thank you. And thank you all for coming out when Olympics is on. So <laughs> I really appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Just got uh, one last quick thing. If, if anyone wants a T-shirt.